for the good you're waiting. I, I didn't know I had to start by myself. I'm not, I'm not used to it. I have people to tell me what I have to do all the time. So my name is David. I'm one of the founders of the Arduino project. I uh, flew in from Malmo, where I live, and play 24-7. I more or less came straight from the lab to the plane. I slept on the plane. I slept on the train from that week to here, because London is like gigantic. And uh, I woke up to have the sandwich and talk to you, and then I live again. So I'm going to make a really quick presentation so you have some time for questions if you want to ask any questions. Uh, because as soon as I'm done, I'm, I'm like running away. Um, so Arduino's logo that look like this. Look at it, look at it. And now look at this one. It's a logo that from my university, Malmo University in Sweden, where I uh, actually work sometimes. And the uh, thing is, the reason why I why I get into uh, got into Arduino, or we all got into Arduino, is because we were all university teachers, or in some way we were related to the university, and we needed tools to teach our students about technology. Thing is that my students are art students. And Massimo, my partner, his students were uh, industrial design students. So as you can imagine, the background in math and um, uh, programming was not super high, for not saying below zero. So but the things I'm concerned about is the technology evolves. And it's something that the day I finish my doctoral thesis, I will be writing about this, actually. It's been 10 years now, so I can take another 10 years. And this is before I retire to write my thesis. Anyway, on the right, on the right side you see a, a cargo mode of the first mobile phone, or one of the first mobile phones. <clears throat> and technology advances, and, and as technology grows in our hearts, it gets smaller in size, for some reason. And, uh, and the smaller it becomes, also, the, the use patterns of this technology changes. And at some point, it stops, it stops being expensive. And it makes sense to use it in different contexts uh, from uh, those that the technology was created for. So we've been living, um, almost everybody in this room, except for that guy with the red pants that is uh, under 15. So, uh, but I guess all, all the rest of us have seen this life, or have lived this life where we saw our parents having or earning enough money to go and buy an expensive piece of machinery, right? And it was like worshipped and taken care of in a special way, right? Right now I carry this phone in my pocket, I think it costs like 700 euros and I do like this all the time. Because I'm just looking forward to buy the next one as soon as possible. So when this happens, we have a different relationship with technology and then we can't let the smaller kids play with that thing. It's not that important anymore. And then it's when there's a real, real transformation happening. You know, when those that weren't really thought to be the first users get access to our technology, it's when the real social transformation happens. So that's, that's the thing that really fascinates me all the time. So when I started teaching technology at the university back in 2001, I was coming fresh from designing microchips to teach art students. I had been working at Infineon for about a year and I was so bored of German PhD uh, engineers that I had to quit. And I, it has nothing to do with being German, don't get me wrong. It has nothing to do with being PhDs. It's a full com it's a combination. <laughs> and um, so, so suddenly I was facing these people that, that they had just wore this beautiful Macintosh. And I couldn't even afford the Macintosh myself as their professor. And uh, they were trying to learn technology. So I had all these multiple problems. First of all, the development tools didn't work on Mac. That was like my first problem. And then uh, I didn't even know how to use the, the Mac per se. I tried for a year and a half, and believe me, it was the worst time of my life. That one and my divorce. I mean, it's like at the same level. I think they happen at the same time, actually. So, so I might be just projecting. So, so. Uh, what happened is that I had to unlearn the way I was taught about technology, and I had to relearn in a different way. I had to transform the narrative of teaching, because those people didn't even know what a bug was. You know, I basically had six months to teach them how to program. And how in hell was I supposed to spend the three years it took me to learn and just transmit this whole thing in six months? So it was very clear to me 
that the knowledge was there, but we had to like chunk it and reshuffle it and just give them, you know, a teaser so they could try things out. And eventually, if they were interested, they could learn more by themselves. So when I changed from teaching software to teach electronics, I already had that lesson learned. And that's what, in a way, made Arduino what it is today. That we were, we already had an experience with Massimo and me in how we had to tell people the story of technology. So it was not so much about technical choices, it was a lot about how to tell the story. And I'm here today to tell you a lot of stories about this logotype. So <clears throat> people tend to think that Arduino is one board. Arduino is not one board, Arduino is all the boards in the world. <laughs> uh, no, no, seriously. Arduino is just a, it's actually a, a platform. And what we do in Arduino is not circuit boards. And people tend to think we make circuit boards, and they are so mistaken. Because if we just made circuit boards, the thing would have never taken off like it did in 2005. And what we do is platforms. You know, there is boards, but there is software development tools, and there is documentation to how to make those two talk to each other. This is my favorite sample there. I made it three times now. I'm fully aware of my of my problems. <laughs> when I don't sleep, I make the same movement a lot of times. But this this one, it's like this one. So it looks a little bit like this. So there is some circuit boards, and then there is a software uh, UI that allows you writing software for this board because this board is a computer without a screen, and then there is a bunch of documentation for it. And when we did this. To be honest with you, uh, we never thought that we were going to have a hundred followers. I mean, the concept of follower didn't exist in 2005. You know, we thought, okay, we're making this for our students, we will document this thing, and, and that's it. And we made 300 circuit boards, serial circuit boards, that we could solve it by hand. And we thought, 150 go to Massimo, 150 go to myself, and this means that in the next three years, we don't need to manufacture anymore. It's great. Um, yeah, we were so wrong. <laughs> so what happened was that I told a story like this at, a, at, a, at an art center in Spain. And they said like, oh, this sounds great. Would you like to, would you mind to make a workshop for us? The word workshop, to me, didn't really exist. You know, I was basically teaching at the university. I was making course curriculum for everyday students. And suddenly they were asking me, do you want to like confront like complete strangers? and then we see what happens. And I said, why not? And so they put me in front of 20 people, and we started soldering the boards. The second day, there were 25 people. The third day, there were 30 people. And all of a sudden, the fifth day of the workshop, there were 58 people. And you know, usually when you make a workshop, people leave. <laughs> you know, as the, as the workshop advances, people leave, because either they have better things to do in life, because they get bored, they discover it's not their thing, whatever. They get laid with somebody else in the workshop, so you use two at the same time. But they were bringing more friends. And uh, what happened the last day of this workshop is that the director of Arts Electronica passed by because he was, he was in a really good relationship with his art center in Madrid and said like, oh, this is an interesting workshop. This is your first day. You know, he was thinking with his logic, like a lot of people first day. I said, no, it's the last day. We're finishing today. He looked at me and said, I want you at my festival. I'm like, sure. I was thin and beautiful, had a long beard. It was kind of like a Jesus Christ from Spain. <laughs> so, uh, of course, people wanted something like that. But but basically, that that was what happened. I mean, we were just like being that honest with people, saying, I'm not going to teach you how a transistor works. I'm going to teach you how a light blinks. And then people were like super happy because they didn't give a fuck about transistors because they couldn't see them anyway. You know, tell them, oh, this chip has twice as many transistors as this chip. Trans, trans what? A chip what? Oh, look, I blink a light. It's beautiful. So, so basically, we started teaching people how to blink lights with the hope that some of them would go on and learn how transistors work. <clears throat> and a lot of them decided to move on. And we started to get millions of followers all over the world. This is the world map of Arduino by continent. Yellow is Europe. It's you and me. Green is North America. Those Americans. And uh, basically, this is based on uh, following the 
the server statistics from the Arduino server between 2005 and 2011, March 2011. It's the last time I had like three w days off so I could actually do anything with my data. I haven't had a chance since. And uh, as you see, Latin America is really like, it's mostly because of connectivity issues. Right? This is a very interesting world map because I think in Europe we have this mindset that the makers movement is happening in the States. But you know what, for real, the makers movement is happening in Europe. We are like 2% over the US. So, kudos to us. So what do we do in Arduino? Well, what we do is that we just try to help people getting started with technology. And I would say almost any technology. Because if you want to move a motor and you want to implement digital, digital control to it, probably the easiest way right now is to do digital right on a pin or analog right and use <coughs> PWM on a pin from an Arduino board and a transistor. We try to create a coherent development and educational experience. If you have a bit of experience in educational tools to teach, not, not to teach engineers to become engineers, but to teach everyday people something about technology, there's a huge difference between the learning tool and the real development tools. It's a huge gap. Right? With Arduino, we try to give the flavor of how a real development tool works. It doesn't have a lot of features. It doesn't have fault completion. It doesn't have, you know, like intelligent search for help or anything like that. But it really gives you the feeling that you are in front of like a super trimmed down version of Eclipse, right? So, and that's very important because when people want to move one step beyond there and they want to start using professional tools, they just, they're not so scared. They understand where the code is, which is what matters when you're using a development tool. And we use a lot of the, we incorporate a lot of user feedback into research and development. Basically, for example, yesterday somebody said, oh, the ESM shield could catch fire because you're using a tantalum capacitor like this and like this. We made some research. We put 30 Arduino boards to try to send SMSs. None of them caught fire. But we listened to this guy and, you know, his concerns were kind of real. So we are going to redesign the ESM shield, for example. You know, if somebody makes a claim of something that could be uh, improving our designs, we will just, of course, incorporate it at the hardware level. And you know, the only reason why we can do this is because we don't manufacture a million boards at once. We manufacture 3,000, 10,000, 5,000, you know, a certain amount, so we can always make changes in the design. That's very important. That's at the core aspect of open source hardware. And one thing we try to do is to answer complex questions within new computing paradigms. So we first try to answer what is embedded, what is ubiquitous, what is palpable, what is wearable, and the word of the day, what is Internet of Things. Yeah, what about that? And we try to break the magic rule of 2.8. And if you don't know what the 2.8 rule is, I'm not gonna tell you now. You will have to ask it in the questions. So, <clears throat> conferences are always really, really boring, so I want to start with one of our latest extreme hacks. You have to show you something kind of funny. I was preloading a lot of videos. No, not this one. This is the newspaper. Wow. The video is super bright. Oh, I can see it here. Not this one. Not this one. Oh, yes, this one. Do I have some? Yeah. Oh, that's kind of fun. I'll do it, yes. That is a, that's a Chevrolet Captiva hack with Arduino boards. If you're even interested in knowing what we did here, we use this uh, Korean motors, Dynamixo, priceless. Really powerful, they can do anything you want to. They have a Cortex M3 on every motor. This is great. This was in July, this year. Um, I can't really tell you what we did this for. I can only show you this video. At some point you will figure out on YouTube what we did. You know, it's, I'm sorry. We are open source, but they pay us. Sometimes. I can tell you that something, if you're gonna have your car, the, the most important thing, you see that there is two antennas, right? One on each side of the car. Well, one of them is dedicated only to measure whether 
the system is losing signal from the remote control. So if it's losing signal from the remote control, it triggers a relay that turns off the whole electricity in the car so the car stops. Because what happens in these cars is that somebody was sitting in the back and was driving, or wasn't driving, he was playing music and the car was driving by itself while listening to the music. It's an automa automated, automated robot car. Okay? You will see that on the internet soon. Are we here? No? Not this one? This one? Oh, oh. I lost track of my slideshow. Ah, oh, there it is. So that's a picture of the of the robot driving the car. It's very bright here, it's hard to see, but you know there's a lot of people building robots to drive cars. They usually like build something that controls the pedals that we did. And then to drive the, the wheel, we build a structure that is basically sitting on the on the seat. And it's just like a bar and has a servo motor at the at the end there and then turns the wheel. And we have also one to turn on and off the key. And one to the, the one on the key is beautiful. It's like a, you see that it's doing like, and it's super nice. Oh, we saw this video already. So I'm gonna tell you about a bunch of examples um, uh, that what we do with Arduino. I, I said I was maybe going to make a demo, but instead of that, what I did is I wrote to Arduino Junes to donate to the contest. So if you're participating in the Internet of Things contest and you win you will get a June. Um, because I was going to use that June for the demo, but since I gave it away, I cannot really use it, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, thing is, I, uh, I work a lot with education. And um, in 2010, I was teaching in Mexico um, at a place called Faro de Oriente. I don't know if any of you have been to Mexico, besides the beach, I mean. And, uh, well, there is, in the city of Mexico, which is pretty large, there is different alternative culture centers where the kids go. Usually it's kids that don't get access to the university, not because they are not clever enough, it's because there's not enough places at the Mexican university. It's like 70% of the applicants basically don't make it. So there is this alternative center where kids can go to learn about arts, about theater, how to play music instrument, psychology, whatever. And uh, and then they have a, a computer room. And in that computer room, they teach kids between uh, 6 and 26 anything about computers. It's a bit like Coder Dojo, but extended. And so I, I came in and I helped the, the responsible there to teach some classes about electronics. And the kids were very engaged. So we made music instruments. And then I asked them, OK, now we did music instruments. What do you want to do next? And they said, robots. And I said, uh, no, no robots. I don't like robots. So I looked in a different direction, and I asked the day after, so we did this, what do you want to do next? Robots. Uh, um, fa in Swedish means the same thing as the one with CK in the end in English. But since there's kids, I would use a Swedish one. <laughs> and uh, so, I, so I went into like, okay, how are we supposed to make robots? Um, because we're in Mexico. And in Mexico, in 2010, it was hard to find the Ati Mega 8. For not talking about the Atimega 328. So what I started to do was actually try to source all the parts to be robots in Mexico so that they could replicate the thing there. Because if I was importing the robots from Europe, it was going to make no sense. So this robot is 100% designed and manufactured with parts found in Mexico. So we did these robots, and then the kids started to make their own shells for them. So you see Batman, beautiful. And then they, they did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of, we a lot of activities about robotics. I, I never taught robotics before, so I really, was not really sure what would be fun to learn. <clears throat> Where did I put my robot videos? Those my skating videos? Over oh, here. So some people made a robot and they only made a, like an animated movie just to show off. I know, the robot wasn't really moving. But in their imagination, it was totally doing it. <laughs> then, we actually did really funny activities. Like, since they were so inexpensive, we could make 15 robots. So we could make robot competitions. So the kids could actually make... Uh... Three, two, one, ya! Yeah. <laughs> they are controlling it with remote controls. 
but they don't realize that they are basically interfering in each other. It's, it's really hard to see, right? But it's like a lot of kids with a lot of robots running on the floor, and then just like pressing the remote controls trying to get the robot to go straight. But they're interfering on each other's robots because they're all the same frequency and they don't realize. So they are doing whatever, but they're having time of their lives. So at this point I basically understood that that the, the thing with robotics was not so much about... I lost my presentation again. Okay. was not so much about the engineering part of robotics. The, the same way that I learned when I was teaching artists about how to program, that I couldn't use the same methods as I, when I was taught how to program, I realized that the, the part in, ro in robotics was not so much about building the robot, it was a lot about playing with it. And I had never really thought about it. And that was part of my resistance to robots. So when I got this phone call from these kids from Spain telling me, hey, we are world champions in robotics, we want to make a robot with you, I was kind of ready to embrace this new mission. No, and so so we, we went into making a robot. These kids are world champions, uh, like four times world champions, and they build their own robots and it takes them a full year. You now they start with the, the they compete in the Robocup. I don't know if you're familiar with Robocup. But they basically give them this mission, says, okay, your robot has to be 22 centimeters diameter, 22 centimeters tall, and can weigh 2.5 kilos. And every year they make their robots a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. So everybody's there like trying to take out screws and so these guys are at the point where they make the robots out of carbon fiber. So it doesn't weigh anything. But it's super strong. And when I met them, Nerea was 15 and Ivan was 14. I, I didn't put a picture in this presentation about how they look like, but Ivan looks like a chicken without feathers. You know, it's like <laughs> super small kid like this. Now he's like this tall. And um, they told me like, yeah, we want to get this robot with you. And I look at what they do, and I was like, it's impossible. My first question was, it's impossible. It's like the robot is 3,000 euros in parts. It's one year of work, plus all these many years of experience. But in the same way that with Arduino, we're building this like staircase of knowledge where we don't tell people, first you learn physics, then you learn this. We tell them, you take the elevator, first you blink the light, and if you're interested, then you go down and learn physics. We had to do something similar for robots. We couldn't just tell them, first you bring the light, then you move a motor, then you... We had to go like, first you move the robot, and then you do the rest, right? So, so uh, basically we designed this robot like this. And uh, I'm gonna show you a quick video. Oh, I keep on taking the wrong window here. About the Arduino robot, this is a teaser. It's a beautiful video in my kitchen. And it's very wide, so you should see it. So the idea is that starting out with a robot takes exactly five minutes, except for the time that you need to charge the batteries, because nobody can send you charge batteries in a package. It's not really okay. It took us two years to make this robot, and it has like nine hardware revisions and, I don't know, seven revisions of the operating system for it, but it can do a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's because we had to charge the battery, so I had to have a coffee. You plug it to the computer like a normal Arduino board, you program it, you can show pictures in it, you can play sound. You know, by default, it does everything basic that a robot needs to do. You can talk to you, you can talk to him or her, you can give it a name, and then you can start moving. You know, one of the biggest problems that you have with robots is that when you're running on batteries, the behavior is very different the first five minutes from the next five minutes because the batteries are going low in voltage and current and then they start behaving the same way. So one of the things we did in this robot is to invest a lot of time in making a proper DC to DC converter, for example, so that the voltage is constant at the motors. And then the behavior, of course, degrades, but it doesn't degrade like this with the normal battery. It takes hours until it degrades. So you can actually run a full class on this robot. If you have 10 robots, you can run a class with 20 kids. You know, it's, that's the kind of idea of what we wanted to do. So, let's go back to the presentation. If I find it, oh, there it is, beautiful. So, we, we do also create a lot of curriculum for schools. This is something that people don't really know about Arduino, because as I said, people just think that we only make circuit boards. Well, um, 
the last months I I finished this project where I, I got to work with 24 schools in parallel and I managed to plant the seed of you know the maker culture into high schools. So I convinced a region, the region of Castilla-La Mancha, to make an experiment with 24 schools to change the technology class from being very theoretical, because funny enough the technology class in Spain is super theoretical, to be very practical instead. I don't know if you have you ever seen a, th a technology book nowadays? In Spain they are beautiful. I mean if I had that had that book when I was a child, right now I would be a philosopher probably. It's like they, they go they cover everything. Because according to the to the curriculum uh, the Ministry of Education in Spain, technology has to cover from pneumatics to uh, cutting metals to the seven layers of the network uh, to everything, everything in in just nine months. So of course there is no room for experimentation because if you just have to cover all the theory in this book, you know, first of all you kill the kids. They don't want to see technology ever again in their lives, and then you spend the 32 euros that the book costs because it costs 32 euros. But it's a beautiful encyclopedia. So what I came in at it was like. I told the, the responsibles in this place, tell them not to buy books this year, we're going to make this thing. For a fraction of the money, we're going to design the curriculum, it's going to be open source, you can keep it forever, and we're going to make this experiment. So we made this critical school, 500 kids, we cut the course in two parts. First was what we call emulation, and in the emulation they were getting tasks, but they wouldn't get a task that everybody would repeat. It would be like the class was cut in groups, and each group would get a different task. They were acting as, let's say, competing hacker teams, building different projects that they had to present the last day of each week. So each week has three sessions. The first day is presentation, the second day is hacking, and the last one is presentation. Presentation from the teacher, and the last one is presentation from the students. And they will present their projects and get critique from the others. And the evaluation is based on the critique. It's not based on uh, whether it works or not. So we did that for four weeks or five weeks. And uh, it were really great. And then they started building their own projects for nine weeks. And then they came all together to a fair to present their results. The kind of experiments we did was like this one, for example. This is we call the we call this the the robot pensionista, which means the retired robot, sitting on its wheelchair in the porch, looking at the dogs passing by. And uh, each each week in this course was thematic. So we didn't teach them inputs and outputs because that's super abstract and a bit stupid. We taught them sports and they would build only sport related projects. It would be pong, it would be basketball with a small cap and a sensor and they had to play with a ping pong ball and so on. They, they were enhancing sports, making table sports. And if in a class there were 25 kids, they would make five projects and they make uh, Olymp Olympic games on Friday and play all the different sports. The week after was a week of magic, and they will learn about capacitive sensing, about, like the, I don't know, the pencils are conductive, and they will like make something like a draw audio experiment, and things like this. This one, for example, this robot, they will make a sensor out of aluminum foil, a capacitive sensor, and this was in the chest of the robot. And when you were tickling the chest, this robot would like lift the legs and the arms and go crazy because you were thinking the robot would go like hee hee. The hee hee is added by me, obviously. But but there were a lot of experiments. In total, we made uh, 24 different experiments, and the kids didn't get to do everything. They didn't get to do the same thing as their partner in the next table. And that's very important because in real life, you know, when you go to a job. Everybody are not, are not doing the same unless you're working, you know, on a chain pulling screws. So it was also like a real life experience. And everything was open source. I mean, we laid everything. Like that construction you saw is made of MDF four millimeters. But we also gave them the files. So if they wanted to go to a local uh, fab lab or hackerspace and cut their own materials, they could also do it. So that was part of the commitment in this project. Everything was open source. Even the typefaces used were open source. And the graphic designer hates me because I forced her to use uh, Scribus uh, to, to lay out the documents instead of InDesign. It took her twice the time, but it's open source now. You know? So after a month, everybody came together. From the 24 schools, 20 made it uh, to the final presentation. Castilla-La Mancha is a really, really big region in Spain. It's bigger than Denmark. 
So it was hard to bring everybody in. But 400 kids made to the final presentation. And this was when I wrote the protocol. And uh, I had the, the responsible for education on my right, and he was making this super boring speech about, yeah, we want the best for your future, blah, 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 blah. I looked at him, I gave him my phone and said, do you take a picture for Instagram? And this man, in his 60s with his beard, looked at me and says like, uh, sure. And then I went down with the kids and he took a picture. And that was the end of his speech. <laughs> but it was great. I mean, the thing is that, um, the thing is that at least he understood that we need a different mindset when approaching this. I mean, technology happens really, really quick. And it affects very much at the social level. You know, 50% of these kids follow me now on Twitter. You know, who, who, who would ever think that 15 year old kids would be on Twitter for whatever reason, right? Well, this man didn't even imagine that possibility. So that's the thing what ha that happens with technology. And we are, I mean, myself, I'm, I'm 39 now to get too old to be teaching kids about technology. That's my point. So, but in Arduino, we do a lot of funky stuff. And I promise you that I was going to show you some other pinnacle hacks. So what happened the week after we had that car is that somebody from Sony Mobile knocked our door at our office in Malmo and said, you know what, it would be really, really great if you were hacking our smartwatches. And we were like, what do you mean hacking the smartwatch? Like, yeah, you make a workshop, I give you 20 smartwatches, and you have the smartwatch, and uh, you keep the smartwatches. And we're like, okay. I said, what about the money? I will not disclose how much money we got. But 48 hours later, ha there you go. The smartwatch was running on Arduino. Actually, I have it in my bag. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it around. And everything is published in, in GitHub, so yeah, you can play, you can play Star Wars. So what you're seeing that in that watch now is a, is a small game since the phone, uh, since the watch has touch and vibration and so on. It's a small uh, Star Wars kind of game, it's like asteroids. There are things falling from the top of their screen and you can shoot to it and stuff. Well, the only thing we did was to make the platform. We had the hardware, we had the knowledge. We built the platform in 48 hours and published everything online. If you go to GitHub, it's a repository called, called Underberg. Underberg with V. And um, somebody else from somewhere else in the world made that game and proclaimed to be the first game ever made for the Sony smartwatch, which is actually true because there were only boring applications. Uh, I hope nobody from Sony is here listening to me now. They're really good people. <laughs> they gave me a free phone. So uh, basically we made it work on the normal Arduino IDE. You know, we took the Arduino IDE, we took the, because we basically got told by them this is the processor it's using, so we started hacking a cellular meter. Uh, the only thing we couldn't get hold of is the Bluetooth chip, which is a shame because it would be really great to be able to do something out of it. So since there is so much talking about the Internet of Things, I will present a couple of connected projects. This is Sebastian from Chile. This is a project from 2011, and he hacked an earthquake uh, detector. And what he did was that he plugged it to an Arduino Ethernet and was tweeting when there was a detection of a vibration, unusual vibration in the building. He got 32,000 followers on Twitter. You know, he was like basically telling the neighbors, hey guys, it's an earthquake coming, leave the house. Okay. Now, two, two years later, if, I have, if my sources are right, he has a small company and he's selling applications. So he's pushing this data on phones. And he has a bunch of these sensors around so he detects uh, earthquakes and sends you messages when there is an earthquake in your area. I mean, as if you couldn't feel by your own means, right? <laughs> you need a message in your phone to tell you, hey, there is an earthquake when your house is falling apart, but anyway. <laughs> but he actually won a prize for the best Internet of Things project of the year. Um, <clears throat> I, I love this project. I don't know, I guess you guys know Usman Hak, the architect that lives somewhere in central London. So uh, he, he had this project called um, Natural Fuse. Do you ever hear about Natural Fuse? No? So the idea is that well, every time you use electricity, anytime you consume any kind of energy, you're of course having some kind of carbon footprint. Um, so his idea was like, what if 
for some basic things like getting a small fan or getting light to read or getting to listen to the radio, we were, we were measuring your carbon footprint and you would just allow yourself to use just enough energy to, to turn on the light and read for half an hour because that's how much your small plant can actually produce or can burn. So they created this machine that has a water deposit and a vinegar deposit. So if you, if you overpass your limit, then you feed your plant with vinegar and you kill it. That's why it's, that's why it's an actual fuse. So from the moment your plant is dead, there is no more electricity for you. So, um, so you could run your machine off mode, in a selfless mode, which means you will be giving away your, your spare energy to other to your neighbors, or your selfish mode, where you could be sucking the energy from your neighbors. So that's the power of running things connected to the cloud. You can actually say, okay, I'm going on vacation for 10 days, I'm, I'm not going to be producing any carbon footprint. You guys can take mine and use it yourself. Uh, that's, that's a bit the idea. <clears throat> so they actually made a network of different devices and they put it in different places. I actually got to know about this project when I was curating a, an exhibition in San Sebastian in Spain where they put a bunch of these in different apartments from people and they have them for a couple of weeks. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's a very interesting project. You know, it's, it's basically, obviously, it's an art project, it's a statement, and so on. And then, of course, everybody knows about Fukushima. There is not a lot to say about the uh, case. But then again, uh, the network that Usman had, was, that Usman had built while well, it was Patre, and it was called Cosm, and now it's called something with X that I can pronounce, uh, was also used to map the radiation in Fukushima. So what happened when the case when the case occurred is that uh, people weren't happy with the information they were getting from the establishment, and they went on trying to map their own uh, measurements of radiation. And they built things like this one. This is a sheet for Arduino that has a Geiger counter, and then it ha has a program that posts the data onto its map. That was actually on Patchway. And then anybody could just go there and check out how good or bad was the, the measurement in different places. Of course, it's not a scientific measurement, but you know, if the, if the point is really red, then you definitely won't go there. Right? It's just, that's the idea behind it. So the idea is that maybe the sensors we can use as citizens are not perfect, but they are good enough to give us a, an idea of what's going on. Right now, there is a platform called Smart Citizen that is actually Arduino compatible that is doing something similar. We have Geiger counters, by right? measuring quality of the air, uh, environmental noise, etc., etc., and have uh, released a new online mapping tool. So, continuing on the idea of connecting stuff, we are actually from Arduino working on a project, and this is getting super deep and boring. But you know, it's like we don't only just do hacks. I mean, the hacks are like fun for a day, but you actually need to eat every week at least once a week is good to maintain this one. And uh, so we participate in different projects. It's a European project we're working with. And the idea behind this project is to create social appliances. Like my washing machine, we actually get from my mom the way she's, wash she's washing uh, uh, berry stains in my white pants. Right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even with my mom anymore, but she knows a lot of tricks. So I could get all her tricks and use them. <clears throat> so the idea is that to do that, we need to create a white label motherboard for appliances. That's pretty clear. So what we're doing in Arduino is to create a white label to connect the washing machine or this washer or whatever, right? So the project has like these different levels, and Arduino we're focusing just on the hardware, how we interface the appliance. And the problem is that in a, in a project like this, I mean, it's really hard to create a white label motherboard for anything. Because if you want to make a mother for a washing machine, it's going to be like this big. And then you can't really put it in a toaster, because toaster itself is already smaller than this size. So to create this project, we actually have to take a modular approach and create a bunch of modules. And we identify that appliances, they have very little uh, needs. They basically heat something, they move a motor, they measure a sensor, or they measure consumption. That's it. So with four modules, you can basically do everything you need. 
Then just for the for the same price, we made a one with a screen called the UI module that allows you uh, showing data because your toaster has no screen. Anyway, if any of you wants to connect the toaster to the internet, let me know. I know how to do it. <laughs> I will not do it myself. Okay? It's like, uh, this is like prototypes. Actually, yesterday night before coming here, I, saw, I wasn't sleeping because I was submitting the report. Because when you make a European project, you have to write pages and pages. So I just submitted the report for this uh, part of the project. And, uh, you know, since we have to be a bit ironic with ourselves, I said I, I would not make a connected toaster, but I made a connected coffee machine. Because what is best than a coffee machine with a website inside, right? So, uh, so our first test of this whole thing was to make a coffee machine that has a website that reports as the coffee is baking. It tells you, yeah, I'm heating up, I'm at 90 degrees right now, I'm about to start boiling, and it's boiling. And uh, it posts everything. And if you have a, we had a VPN, in this case we actually made a test where I was in Brussels with a European commissioner, and we were baking coffee on distance. And of course, nobody could come and bring us a coffee from Sweden to Brussels. That's where the whole concept fails dramatically. <laughs> but up to that point, it was just great, okay? It's like... Um, actually, I have a video of this, but it's really boring to wait for three minutes until the coffee boil. So I will spare you the pleasure of watching that video. But again, it's something very important because Arduino is a company now. Arduino, for the first five years, was barely was just an open source project. And at some point, we realized that we had to spend. Uh, personally, I was spending five days a week just to maintain the website. You know, and I had to still go to university and teach. So we got to this point where it was like we need to hire people to get this thing going. So we decided, since we were five people living in five different countries, that the best structure was to create a holding. We created a holding of companies. So I have an office in Malmo, there is an office in Switzerland, there is an office in Italy, there is an office in Bangalore, and so on. So, so as a company, the salary is, is really hard when you say, you know, we are doing this whole stuff and we're giving it away for free. People come and say, are you crazy or what? Right. So the commissioner in the European project where we were making all these boards and stuff came and said that, is this whole thing open source? I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Because everything we do is open in Arduino. And people aren't really used to it. No, no, it's like we try to apply the same logics that people apply to the open source software production or the free software production. Like, if you pay me to make it, from the moment I've done it, I don't need to be paid again. You know, it's there. I will need to be paid to be maintaining this thing. But, you know, the production is done. It's, a, it's like a fair, we're we starting to call it a fair hardware business model. So that's how we operate in Arduino. Yeah, I can tell you a story about you have to share, piece of an ice cream, it melts. And if you don't eat it, it melts anyway, they're gonna copy it anyway. So it's better if you share it. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> there is ten minutes for questions. If any. Um, yeah, it's everything is online. Everything will be online on, on the Arduino, official Arduino website. It's just that we are really busy because we have a major release next Thursday. So I'm just trying to, I'm gonna give you the right address. The address where you can find everything right now is my family name, quartiages.com slash bedstart, which is the name of the Swedish office of Arduino, slash EM. Here you have like a, everything in English and it's reactive design as you just saw, beautiful. And uh, there is PDFs for every week. So if you click on week one, okay. uh, just a PDF here you can download that contains everything about learning how to program. Week two contains everything about uh, building sports games. For example, the Pong game is like this. You have the final circuit with two buttons and a line of LEDs, so you press on one side, goes to the other side, and so on. Yeah, everything is explained step by step. So the idea is that 13-year-old kids can build this thing by themselves without any help. So I'm sure you can do it. And uh, yeah. This is the four weeks where people were building or they were following the class before they started their own projects. They are documented here. Okay, more questions? The back. 
The robot. The uh, which robot? We 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 write in the Arduino interface. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, you're in the back and then you Oh yeah, the 2.8 rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like if, if I make this and I'm the manufacturer and I sell it to my distribution network, if they don't buy a large amount, I multiply the price by 2.8. And then when they sell it to the final customer, they multiply by 2.8. So the final price is like super high, right? So, but if you buy a million from me, then I, I have a margin there so I can make it smaller. You get a discount and you get super happy. And I get more happy because I get work for many months. That's the idea. So, making an Arduino work right now costs something in the range of the 17 or 16 euros. I'm not sure even, so I don't take care of that. But the thing is, uh, if you sell it for 20, then you see the difference is definitely not 2.8. So, that's, that's the idea. The margin is very small. Yeah, more questions? The same question. Ah, clever guy. Okay. Five minutes, so we can make like collective hacks and stuff. Uh, I, I would love to get my watch back. Please. <laughs> okay, now I, I will go there. We can, I can hug you and just. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one more question. Yeah. Was it was it your passion with education or your passion with hardware that made Arduino take off? It's a good question. Um, I, like everybody, I got a personal crisis when I was in my almost last year at the university. And it wasn't because I was doing bad, I was doing quite good, but I wanted to study fine arts. Because I thought that technology, it was in a way very non-human, right? It's like, we are forced to put ourselves in a situation where, you know, when we start working with a project in coding, for example, it might take you three hours until you go back to be in the right state of mind before you can actually go into solving complicated aspects of your work, right? I think that's why we have these long hacking sessions, because it takes so long to get started that you don't just don't want to leave. Uh, and I experienced that the last years at university, so I really wanted to change career. But then again, I realized after some years I was really good in technology, so it was a little stupid not to take advantage of that. And then try to combine both. So that's why education seemed to me like a really clear career path. Like, uh, you know, I like technology, I like to talk about it, I like to be with people. Uh, so this was a, a clear thing. Then when Arduino came along, Arduino was not my first platform. I had been teaching with Basic Stand before, so I made my own boards. Then I was making a second platform, and then when I met Massimo, I was on my way to the third platform. I had failed twice. Yeah. And, and the same with Massimo. Massimo had made a couple of platforms. Yeah, he had even been participating in making the wiring platform, for example. So when we met, we had like a lot of collective knowledge on what would work. And we were just lucky. And there was literally no competition for five years. So we could build this whole thing very slowly. And yeah, so I, both we had, or everybody in the team had a passion for education, and we were very lucky that you know we could take it very easy. And we, we all had a job, because we had to be, be from this the first five years, and we were like starving right now. Or we were like 10 kilos dinner, probably. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, the URL, I didn't catch the... Oh, uh, the yeah, it's, it's actually, it's complicated because it's my family name. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to type it somewhere else. Uh, what if I open a document? I can take this one, and I can type it here. Oh, no, not like that. And we take this whole thing and we make it like uh, a gate. We maybe create and black. There you go. Quartier.com slash Bergstar slash yeah. No questions? Okay, now it's hugging time. Thank you very much. <laughs>